Good evening, back for another episode of Meteorology Lab, and starting to get a little bit more like spring. We've got the clouds rolling in, you can see the low uh, tropical moisture moving left to right there, and kind of a uh, kind of a nice evening, a little, a little bit warm here. We've got some thunderstorms going on in uh, Oklahoma. These uh, just sprung up, and you can uh, see the wind field here to the uh, north of those uh, storms. We've got a little bit of a cold front back behind that. So let's draw that out. Looks like we got a little bit of a mixed front here, actually. So here's the Canadian air mass. It uh, extends all the way back to about the, tr the Trinidad area. And then we've got the Pacific air mass further out to the west in New Mexico. So we'll try to figure out if there's maybe a Pacific front back in that area. Very uh, classic pattern here. And let's check out the uh, dew point and see if we can find the dry line real quick. The uh, moisture is going to be indicated by shading of those uh, dew point lines. Okay, so we're talking about uh, this right here. This, this is the uh, stronger moisture, the moisture axis located roughly from East Texas up to about Tulsa. And this is going to be the uh, dry line right here from about uh, Wichita Falls down to about Junction. And you can see very warm air back behind that. Uh, we've got 98 degrees being observed there at Sanderson way down here. Okay, the surface plots might be a little bit less messy. I don't know if I can get that to come up. If not, I'll just use uh, digital atmosphere here. Oh, there we go. Okay, had it there for just, just a second. All right, you can see that 97 there, over 11 at Sanderson. And we can pretty much trace that dry line right like that. So there's the Canadian uh, system up here. And then the Pacific system. Well, we've got 92 at uh, Abilene, 85 at uh, Midland, 82 at Roswell. That to me sounds like uh, dry line air. So I think it's only when we get back to about the Albuquerque area that we start picking up the uh, colder air mass. Okay, let's check out the uh, thunderstorms. There's uh, GR level two right there. So it's kind of uh, linear, stretching from East Oklahoma City up to about Bartlesville. A few thunderstorm warnings on the uh, northernmost storms. Not really any particularly strong structure here. They are a little bit isolated. We've got tops up to about maybe, uh, let's see, about 48, 49,000. And circulations in those cells. Let me see if I can pick that up. Uh, we're going to have to go to the uh, Tulsa radar to really see motion, so I'm not too sure what that's going to look like in that storm. But anyway, that's the picture right there. You can see some higher elevated convection back over northwest Oklahoma here. Kind of a very unstable picture here. And we've got some other convection down along the cold front right here around uh, Duncan. Okay, I had a very neat uh, graphic to pull up. Uh, let me see if I can figure out where that, where I put that. I've got about 21 tabs open. Okay, there it is. And this is from that uh, Couchman Vetter site. Uh, definitely a great site for GO16, GOES R data. And you can see right here around Stillwater, this is about 5 p.m. And we can see a little bit of initiation underneath that cirrus. So you can see the higher albedo of the cumulonimbus tops right there and the lower albedo of the cirrus right here. 
and you can see a little bit of maybe a flanking line right here and then other clouds along the boundary further down into the uh, Midwest City, not, not, not Midwest City, uh, I want to say the Yukon area. Okay, let's run that forward and watch that storm build. This is always uh, fun to check out. We have a lot of problems in situations like this where there's a lot of broken and overcast clouds. That makes it very hard to pinpoint the outbreak of initiation because we're very de dependent on satellite data for that, where we see like the clustering of cumulus areas. That's very important. And without that, we're kind of limited to surface data and radar. And we're talking especially up at the higher tilts because you got to remember the cells build at about initially about 15 to 25,000. That's where they first show up on the radar. So if you're looking at this 0.5, you're probably going to miss it. So before convection develops, that's a very good time to be using composite reflectivity so you don't miss that development. Okay, let me skip forward a little bit and we'll see how the convection progressed. You can see a little bit of a clearing area moving in where the storm has taken place. Some more development there and you can see some very prominent shadows over the Interstate 30, 35 area. We roll that forward and we can see what looks like multi-cell tops going up. One uh, important feature that I see here is kind of a conspicuous absence of inflow stratocumulus. So that tells me that maybe these cells are a little bit on the high side. I don't know, is that supported by the, the uh, surface data? Let's take a look here. I'm going to pull up the uh, surface data for Oklahoma. Okay, so there's Oklahoma right there. Let me grab the uh, 8 p.m. data. There's a possibility this may interfere briefly with the feed. So, there's our neat little chroma key. I got it balanced a little bit more so you can see the, you can see the uh, storms back behind me. And back to digital atmosphere here. Okay, so we're going to look at the uh, surface plots around uh, that storm area. So I'm going to set a couple of uh, stations right there around that region, bring up the radar, and then bring up the uh, surface plots. Okay, oops, we have the operator data. So this is the uh, new digital atmosphere program that's under under development. I'm, I've been working on this quite a bit. So I can see what looks like maybe 64 degree temp, uh, dew points feeding into that uh, area. Let's see, where's my pen tool? Can't get that pen tool to come up in digital atmosphere for some reason. Anyway, yeah, the dew points, uh, I don't know, they're a little bit, uh, I would say, moderate. Um, and what I'm talking about is that inflow stratocumulus. 
the absence of stratocumulus. There might be a little bit in there, so maybe we're not so starved with, mo with moisture as I initially thought. Okay. You can see the outflow boundary right there, kind of gusting out ahead of these cells. So that would be an indicator that uh, these may be on the non-severe side. Spectrum width uh, doesn't show that too well this time. And uh, let's see. That's it for Oklahoma. We'll just kind of move along and see what other products we have here. Here's the SPC plots uh, showing enhanced uh, risk area right there, kind of embedded in that slight risk in southeast Kansas and northeast Oklahoma. We do have a severe thunderstorm watch out for that region. There it is right there. And not really any storm reports yet, except maybe a couple hail uh, reports right there. Okay, let's go to 250 millibars and uh, check out the pattern that we're looking at this evening. Wow, we've got a very uh, zonal pattern out in the Pacific. Pretty uh, long fetch, a couple thousand miles long of west to east flow and culminating in this polar front jet in the Nevada, Utah area. So just to the north of Texas and Oklahoma. And in this region here, there's the uh, polar front axis or the polar front jet axis from southern Colorado into southern Iowa. So we go back to that relationship of uh, the troughs and ridges. 500 millibars maybe is a little bit better for that. So let me use 500 for that. There's our trough indicating the very cold air. The uh, Pacific air coming in in the lower levels. And then somewhere downstream we have the ridge. And I think we have to go quite a ways out to find that. Maybe a bit of ridging right there. So this is the uh, warmer tropical air. So the jet is located right there. We're going to expect to find the polar front jet or the polar front at the surface. Something like that. Well, so happens uh, this is one of those evenings that doesn't really work out that way. I believe what we're seeing is more of a pattern maybe like this. So this kind of demonstrates we don't, those are rules of thumb, they don't always work the way we expect. In fact, uh, maybe there are a couple of lows out there in the uh, Midwest, so maybe it's not so much out to launch. There's, there's a little bit of a Canadian low right there, kind of a complex situation this evening. Looks a little bit like that right there. And we've got a little bit of a polar front jet being picked up by this Norman sounding 55 knots right there and 22 degrees Celsius, 72 degrees Fahrenheit up at the 850 millibar level this morning. Some very warm air there. Oh yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, upper air dynamics. And before I get into that, let me... Uh, let me drop this on something interesting, and then we'll take a look at the chat. Let me grab a bit of uh, throat spray here. Okay, excuse me for that, and uh, let me say hello on chats. Got a packed house here tonight. Andrew's here, first one on as usual. And uh, let's see here. Andrew, looking forward four to two tonight's webcast. Very interesting topic. Yeah, we need to cover a little bit of that. Sue M checking in, and uh, Mike Wan and Mark. Fun with tech. Uh, Justin Pulliam. Kevin McKinney. Michael Burrell is here. Fred Reamer up in North Dakota. Adam Davis. Mick. And uh, Alexi. I, I appreciate the... Uh, Patreon donation, Alexi, I got that. Also got one from 
um, Bert, it's either Bert or Burl Henry. Can't read my own writing. <laughs> I mean, this is my own writing. It's really bad. Should be a doctor. All right, uh, Brett Dean, 54 degrees, southern Jersey, much needed rain. Michael Cochinet, uh almost missed a start. Justin Pulliam, looks like a pretty day in North Texas. Fred Reamer mentioning the Rossby waves. Dr. Wells checking in. And I probably can't go through each one of these messages, but I'll just kind of point out, I guess, uh, I see Thomas Copeland here. I like Alex uh, Nasinski, that's a new one. Can I look at the forecast in California? I will try. It's very difficult to cover each area of the U.S. I normally don't do that. I just have to focus on the area of interest to, to keep things moving along. That's just kind of the way it works here. I'll try to hit that if I can. Ryan watching the uh, storms blowing up over Oklahoma City in Kansas tonight. And uh, Brett Dean asking if the circles on the wind barbs is the visibility. Yeah, Brett, I've uh, seen your question pop up before, and I'm trying to figure out what you're ref referring to. Oh, uh, are you talking about these here? Circles around the wind barbs. That's the only one I can think of. Th this is uh, mentioning bad data here. Okay. If you're talking about the other circles, like on these, let me see if I can find an example. Well, I can't find one, but uh, when you have calm air, you'll have a circle around a plot, and that indicates calm winds. Okay, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I know we kind of go at a fast pace here, and uh, sorry if I, if I lost you there. VHC Media is here, and uh, Carl Berghoff. Dr. Wells mentioning models disagreeing today. And uh, Ryan concurring, I think. And uh, Victor Cabot made it in. And let's see here. Justin Pulliam asking if these upper air charts are from one of Tim's applications. Uh, these are from the Canadian Weather Service. I, I really like the charts that they use. Let me see if I can find the legend here. Yeah, there, there it is, Environment Canada, 250 millibars. I was going to switch over to the American charts. They've got uh, good DIFAX charts, very similar to this, but they retired those on March 21st. Very sad. There was almost a 45-year run of those charts, and they decided to pull the plug for whatever whatever reason. So, I don't know. All right, let's see. Okay, we can go ahead and move on. Man, we got 36 people here. I'm hoping we can break 40 tonight. That would be pretty cool. Okay, I was going to cover a bit of dynamics. Uh, 250 millibar. This is where we find our long waves. Okay, long waves are uh, not these small waves, but they're very large waves. In fact, uh, there may be a long wave embedded right here. And that would be an indicator where things are just kind of sh sagging southward. So if you have a trough in there, it's going to be a little bit deeper than usual, for example. This might be kind of a long wave ridge out in the Pacific, or I'm sorry, long wave trough out in the Pacific. So definitely a bit of troughiness there and a very large scale there. And another name for these uh, long waves are Rossby waves. And they're named after a scientist named Rossby who first investigated those. Now, normally the uh, wavelength on Rossby waves are about 50 to 100, 120 degrees degrees of longitude. So we're talking about uh, 
scales about like that. So that's 50 degrees right there. 120 degrees is going to be like that. So these are very large scale waves. And quite often we don't really see those directly on these charts. And normally there's going to be about 3 to 6 around the hemisphere. And normally we see about 4 to 5 most of the time. And if there's a, a low number of those, like uh, 2 or so, the uh, long waves will tend to retrogress. So what that means is if we have a lot of cold air on the East Coast and we have a low wave number, then we're going to find a lot of the cold air starting to shift into the central U.S. and eventually into the western U.S. Now, if we have a large number of, short, of long waves, the pattern will be progressive, and they'll move rapidly from west to east. Okay. One way we can find waves is uh, through Hovmuller diagrams. You know, it's kind of hard to pick out long waves on this, but this is a chart we can use. So what you see here is longitude. So this is 90 degrees west. That's going to be pretty much in the central U.S. Zero is going to be a Europe. And 180, 180 degrees is going to be the central Pacific. And then the scale over here on the left. This is increasing time as you go down. Okay, so I'll let that sink in for just a little bit while I grab some of my water here. There's some uh, scientific con concepts that we can't really rush through, and I know it kind of takes a few minutes to really understand them, but you can see, let's think about this. Uh, this is right now, 25th. Here in the central U.S., we're at 90 degrees west. And uh, Ron, Ron Chalfont in California, he's about right here. And uh, Sue and Sarah, they're in Indiana, about right there. So this is showing us that we have a uh, height anomaly, which means a trough, over the central U.S. right there. But if you go back a few days, maybe six days, this is six days ago, and we can see that trough was a little bit more along the Pacific coast. So this is actually showing the progression of the troughs like that, like sloped lines. And if we go back through the Hovmuller diagram, you can see a lot of these systems progressing So, in other words, with increasing time, they're moving to the east that way. So, if you want to check these out, a good place to go to is uh, this website, esrl.noaa.gov slash psd slash map slash time underscore plot. I don't know if there's an easier way to get to that, but uh, this lets you uh, plot fields that same way. So you can see I've got geopotential height, I've got anomaly, and I've got the uh, range of latitude and longitude, and then I've got the uh, dates picked out right there. There's the end date and the uh, start date. So you can use that to kind of uh, trace out where you're troughs are going, and if you have a blocking pattern in place, kind of stalling everything, you're going to have maybe some chunks in here that kind of interrupt this progression that you see. So definitely check that out if you get a chance. Uh, the concept of this is very simple. It's just another way of looking at these upper air charts. 
Okay, that's probably about as much as I want to get into dynamics because this would probably feel like a two-hour workshop and I don't want to put a lot of people to sleep here. So let's keep this moving on here. Okay, there's our satellite image and uh, this is showing the kind of a series of uh, upper air systems moving in from the Pacific like that. And it looks like we have maybe one system over Iowa, maybe another one over Nebraska and Kansas, and another one over Colorado. And probably our main cold core low is out in this area right there. So most of these very bright uh, cloud materials that you see here, this is infrared. So you're seeing mostly cirrus and uh, cirrus stratus and uh, alt cumulus, maybe, maybe a little bit of alt cumulus. That's probably what this would be right here. And this is not responsive to low clouds. That's really where uh, visible imagery excels. So here's visible imagery, and we can definitely see a lot of low clouds. So that's going to be this stuff right here. That's uh, stratocumulus. And the actual cirrus is uh, a little bit hard, harder to find, but it's kind of embedded in this area right here. You can see some streaks, some transverse streaks that look kind of like that. So here's the cumulonimbus going up in uh, central Oklahoma. You can see a little bit of stratocumulus and altocumulus right there. And a little bit of an embedded cumulonimbus right there in southeastern Colorado. And this is cold core convection close to the upper level low. And it looks like we got a little bit of dust right there in the Midland area. See it right there? That's uh, pretty sure that is uh, dust. Okay, time to look at the thermal picture. You can see a pretty uh, stout cold air mass over the Hudson Bay region. So some of that is spreading into the uh, northern plains. And it looks like our frontal systems are set up kind of like this right here. So maybe a piece of that is the Canadian system, kind of looking like this right here. There's the cold air advection coming into the Canadian front right there. And this is the Pacific front. And that's making its way into the Roswell and Las Cruces area right there. So that should be in Texas overnight. Okay, as far as soundings, uh, let's take a look at that. We've got the storms going up in Oklahoma, so we'll look at a Oklahoma sounding. So this is uh, Norman this morning. And this is showing a pretty uh, stout cap right there. The cap is a little bit on the uh, low side. Normally we, we find it near the 700 millibar level, a little bit higher. On this day, we find it uh, more at the 850 to 800 level. So that's helping to keep uh, the development suppressed. And we've got some very good lapse rates above the cap. A little bit of warm air above that, but uh, with the approach of the upper level dynamics, we end up seeing a lot of this uh, start to destabilize. A lot of cold air starting to build in these layers right there. And of course, as the day goes on, we see the moisture make its way northward and uh, often warmer temperatures. Those will affect in and shift the lines a little bit further to the right, which means your parcels will be able to, be able to overcome the capping a little bit easier. Okay, let's see what the sounding look like after 12 hours. So we'll advance this into this evening.
And there we go. That's the uh, new Norman sounding, and you can see a definite change. We've eroded the cap thanks to the approach of upper-level dynamics. We've got cooler air aloft. So this is more primed for severe weather. So if we try to construct a lifted parcel, it's going to look something like that. There's our convective inhibition. <clears throat> And there's our cape right there. So that's going to be about 1,500 to 2,000 cape. And there's our storm top. And there's our storm overshoot right there. Up at about uh, 50,000 50, feet or so. Okay, let's see here. 8, 8.33. Let's uh, move along here and... Uh, take one look at the dynam dynamics before we go into the forecast. Okay, so right now, this is what the picture looks like. There's the polar front jet coming into the El Paso area. And the nose of it coming into the Wichita and Oklahoma City area right there. So you can see a lot of the stronger short waves kind of north of the jet right there. So they're kind of scraping that little line of storms right there in the Oklahoma City area, but really no help south of that. So south of the jet there, we don't have the good dynamics, which means we don't over overcome the cap as well. And we don't have as much uh, destabilization in the upper atmosphere and that's really important what, what we need on a storm day like this. Okay, let's see how things progress overnight. You can see a couple more waves working into the Oklahoma City area overnight. See, there, there's a good wave, so if we have moisture overnight, uh, that would keep an, a chance of uh, precept there tomorrow tomorrow morning. But I think that front is going to sag south a little bit, so that may carry stuff more towards the Red River. But here comes the main trough, and that's going to roll out into the Texas area during the day. There's a good slug of energy by 4 p.m. coming into the Dallas area. And then during the evening, that's going to move up into Arkansas and Tennessee and uh, Mississippi very quickly and then by Thursday morning that'll be moving out into Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, and Michigan like that. Okay. And then not much not much else going on later in the week. Just continued troughing here. And remember that's kind of a manifestation of cold air in the low levels. So it looks like we'll be looking at a slightly colder pattern here coming up for the weekend. Okay, time to head into the forecast and we'll start out with the mesoscale models. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to reload this. Now I'm going to switch to 23Z here. Let me see if we have the current model real quick. I'm looking at the high-resolution rapid refresh. And this is going to give me an idea how those storms in Oklahoma are going to uh, behave as the evening wears on. Okay, so you can see the zero Z data came in. So we're getting the full benefit of the radio sound data. Okay, so it uh, kind of caught the uh, pattern of thunderstorms around the Bartlesville area. It looks like there's a little bit of a difference there. Kind of more of a line from about Stroud up to uh, Chanute. Another storm right there near, uh, looks like uh, west of Paul's Valley.
Okay, so there's a few discrepancies there, but uh, nothing that too serious there. And there's the front uh, coming southward like that. Okay, so as the evening wears on, it looks like uh, some of that wave activity catches up with the front, and we see a little bit of reinforcement of the frontal boundary there. So a little bit of uh, storms starting to intensify along that cold front. And the uh, main thrust of that will be mostly up the I-44 area and north of I-40 right, right there. So kind of a quiet evening for Texas. Okay, then tomorrow morning you can see the tail end of that uh, works into the Dallas area. And then we're going to be seeing even stronger dynamics coming in from the west. And we get the addition of surface heating. And now to look at things tomorrow, we need to look at the NAM. So I'm going to grab this NAM 3 kilometer. And we don't have the zero Z data, but we'll just take a quick look and uh, see what the forecast is. Okay, so the NAM is uh, looking for kind of a similar picture to as the high resolution rapid refresh. Maybe a little bit of a bias towards the I-40 area, but we can see with the addition of heating. We see that the development of a line of storms from about uh, Longview to west of uh, Shreveport up to west of uh, Little Rock and into the Ozarks here. So of course we're going to have the uh, possibility for a few severe cells in this. And to get a quick look at uh, the possible severity. We can take a look at the uh, significant tornado parameter. So this will give us some of the key ingredients that we want to look at on a uh, severe th thunderstorm day. So let's see, we'll advance this forward. I think I lost my frame here. There it is. Okay, evening hours, there we go. Wow, we, we're picking up some purple there, which is uh, bad. That means a little bit of severe potential there for Arkansas and the Shreveport area. So you can see this is 21Z, this is 4 p.m. around the time of maximum heating. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop the cursor in this purple area. This is out ahead of the line. Remember the line is about right here. You can see that outflow cutting into that field. And we can take a look at the elements that are really boosting those values up. So here comes the forecast sounding. And this is showing us that uh, the uh, bulk wind difference is a, a very significant contributor. And we can see 90, 100 knot winds. So that's going to help a whole lot with storm organization tomorrow. We can see that storm relative helicity is uh, kind of high. I can see the curvature on the diagram right there. So we're sweeping out kind of a large area like that. LCL. Well, we've got uh, very good humidity. You can see the temperature and the dew point very close together right there. And uh, Cape. Cape is also kind of high. You can see the lifted parcel producing a large Cape area right there. So a lot of positive factors for tomorrow. About the only negative factor I would see maybe is perhaps the uh, storm motion vector is so strong. See that? Uh, this is the right movement vector, and you can see 
50 knots. This is on the 50 knot radio, which means storms are going to be very fast moving. And the problem with that is that if we try to sweep that area out with the 0 through 0 0.5 kilometer part of the of the uh, helis, the hodograph, we get kind of a narrow area. We want kind of we want the storms to be a little bit slower moving. You can see that if we had a cell moving northeast at 30 knots, we would drop a dot right there and we would potentially sweep out a very large area. And that could be even larger if we had a little bit more right motion. So anyway, this is going to be quite a ordeal for storm chasers with this very fast storm motion. This is kind of a day where you're going to have to just kind of pick your target and wait and watch everything roll by like a big freight train. Okay, the other negative factor that I see here is the Cape is, or I should say the level of free convection is a little bit high, which means the Cape values are kind of at a high altitude. And I really like to see those closer to the ground, kind of more in this area right here. Okay, looks like the algorithms here have painted out a PDS tornado. So we definitely have the potential for some severe weather tomorrow there in Arkansas, all the way down to Louisiana. So I would hope that any storms that do form, any tornadoes that do form, are out in the fields and not rolling through some of these towns. Okay, so earlier in the day, it looks like there is some... A little bit of potential here for severe weather during the morning hours around the Dallas area. So we're going to look for that maybe overnight in the Red River Valley area. And that'll move eastward during the day. And then we get the addition of heating. And then after dark, things move into Mississippi and it looks like our values kind of start to go down. Okay, let me zip through the GFS. Man, we've got so much to look at here. Let me grab a bit of my soda here. Okay. This is the uh, GFS Global model here. So this is our current picture right here. You can see a lot of cool air out on the West Coast and in Northern Canada. So when we do tomorrow's webcast, we're going to be definitely looking at some severe weather. So definitely check in tomorrow, and uh, we should have some interesting stuff to look at. GFS going for a Bear Clinic low right there over the boot hill of Missouri. Cold front extending down to Houston. Warm front up to Illinois. And you can see that area of storms out in Missouri and Arkansas. So it should be pretty busy. Things move eastward overnight, and uh, the GFS goes for a little bit of a decline in uh, convective activity during the overnight hours. In offhand, I don't know. I don't know what the cause of that would be. Maybe a little bit of capping. I don't know, maybe I can drop a cursor over and uh, see what's going on. Okay, this is 3 in the morning. I'm going to put a cursor. I'm going to keep it away from this precip area and put that. Yeah, I'm going to drop this for midnight over central Alabama. Maybe northern Alabama. Okay, we'll do that. Okay, what is the problem tomorrow with Alabama? Let's take a look. Well, one way is we can take a look at these values here. We can see that the LCL, which is the which is kind of correlated with relative humidity, that's kind of low. 
all of the other values are kind of low and I can see the cape is not very high don't have a lot of uh, steep lapse rates here on the red line and it looks like the altitude of that L that LFC looks like that's a problem too Uh, bulk wind difference, uh, that's it's about 60 knots. That's going to be moderate to uh, strong, so not really a big problem there. And it looks like uh, the storm motion vector is right there. It looks like the algorithm here is sweeping out a elevated layer that looks like a effective layer that's up above the surface if we were going to get surface based storms out of that that would look like some fairly decent helicity so I wouldn't completely write this off but it does it, it does look like the, the uh, instability is a little bit on the low side Okay, so let's see. Let's finish this off and uh, let's see where we at. Storms roll eastward. Uh, let me give you the uh, legend here on the top. There you go. So there's the uh, Vala time. Storms move eastward into Alabama, kind of a line of showers, then into Georgia, and it looks like most of the activity kind of on the weak side, Thursday going into Friday. But we got more activity back here in Oklahoma, Texas, and Kansas. See the very strong uh, thermal gradient right there. A little bit of baroclinicity coming together right there. We get one wave move up into the Kansas City area. Very strong thermal gradient right there in Arizona on Friday. So we're kind of recharging this area here for late in the week. And it looks like finally on Saturday, Friday night, yeah, Friday night this area comes together. So we got a warm front right there along uh, Interstate 20 in Texas. And you can see the Gulf is open. Yep, look at that open gulf uh, pressure isobars going all the way into the Gulf of Mexico. So that's going to mean strong flow up to the warm front and a uh, chance of, certainly a chance of thunderstorms, I think, Friday night in the Red River region. Yep, so they blow up Friday night. Looks like a short wave starts to move eastward, and uh, we see activity moving east. Wow, look at that snow right there around Clayton and Tucumcari. Definitely a late season system there. Looks like the next wave comes out, and uh, this has a little bit more access to the flow of Gulf moisture. We get a squall line Saturday night in Arkansas and Louisiana, parts of East Texas too. Cold air advection on the back side and it looks like the cold front from Indiana down into Louisiana. Warm front well up to the north and then the occlusion kind of like that. Okay, so that'll move eastward during the uh, start of the week. So we're up to May 2nd. In May 3rd, you can see the Gulf starting to open up here. So some of that moisture starting to make it up to Iowa here. A little bit of a frontal boundary up there. Looks like the next frontal system kind of approaches Texas and Oklahoma on the uh, 3rd. Looks like now we're focusing chances of thunderstorms on uh, the 4th and 5th on the southeast U.S. So kind of a cool pattern for Texas. And look at that 540 line coming all the way down almost to Memphis and down to Springfield. The 540 line is 
commonly regarded as a trans transition line between snow and rain. So this is definitely a cool air mass. Kind of like the last hurrah of winter. And this system moves up the Atlantic coast on the 5th. Then we get a bit of quiet weather, and you can see we're not tapping the Gulf. We're tapping Mexico, so it's going to be kind of a warm downslope day. This is on the 6th, on the weekend. And then pretty quiet for the following week. And then I can see some chances of thunderstorms coming together. Looks like the dry line might be active around the 11th. But this is getting way out there. But you can see the Gulf is definitely open at this point. Okay, man, that's a lot to cover. So I think uh, that'll wrap it up. Let me take a quick look at chat. I'm going to have to copy this to my clipboard and read it afterwards. But uh, let me see here. I think I saw a question there about short waves. Uh, where was that short wave question? How do you see the short waves so easily on the dynamics chart? What gives them away? Okay, so Andrew's talking about, uh, let's see. Yeah, this chart right here. I'm not identifying any specific short waves, to tell you the truth, but I can see that there's a lot of ridging and ridging and troughing in here. Maybe a trough right there, maybe a trough there. But this is kind of a very noisy pattern here, and this is telling me that we've got a lot of instability here. Um, prob definitely some short waves embedded in here, not so much down to the south. You can see that the flow down there is pretty much absent of that. So this is definitely enough to kind of upset things and uh, create some vertical motion. This is more of a classic short wave right there. So this is, if I'm actually looking for specific waves, that would be a short wave right there that I would be looking for. Now this is more channeled flow right here. So this is more the result of speed shear. So there's cyclonic uh, shear right there. And we get cyclonic vorticity in that region right there. And so this would not be any distinctly identifi identifi identifiable short waves. That would be more channeled, more of a channeled pattern there. Now this is more of a short wave right there. See that coming into Texas on Wednesday? That's going to be definitely associated with some strong upward motion. You can see that kind of dig in during the day on Wednesday. Right down into the Dallas area, so we'll be watching for cap removal in that area. Increasingly favorable skew tees for severe weather and uh, I mentioned cap removal and higher capes, so we'll watch for that. Okay, so I'm about talked out, so I appreciate you watching the webcast, and uh, maybe we'll see you all tomorrow. We will have that severe weather going on in Arkansas, so I'll try to cover that as much as possible. And I think that's it for me. Have a good evening, and uh, we'll see you then.